the lessons that we learn from studying insurgency, counterinsurgency, the hypothesis we can test with, with the kind of quality data that this is an example of, it's, it's going to be relevant. We can't just wish away the threat. It's, it, even in an era of great power competition. But the greatest challenge is rallying people to embrace an idea. This, I think, is the hardest part that any special forces officer, especially in, in host nations, would have to contend with. Welcome to episode 11 of the Irregular Warfare Podcast. I am Shauna Sinnott, and I will be your host today along with Nick Lopez. Today's episode is a deep dive into insurgency and counterinsurgency efforts in the Philippines, presented through the perspectives of both a Philippines Armed Forces officer and a U.S. Special Forces advisor, each of whom has decades of experience in Philippine counterinsurgency efforts. We start today's episode with an introduction to the history and evolution of insurgency and counterinsurgency in the Philippines, with a focus on U.S. support to building effective counterinsurgency forces in both the pre- and post-9-11 eras. Based on shared operational perspectives and collaboration on research, specifically an extensive micro-conflict database, our guests discuss what makes COIN forces effective. They then discuss the implications of their lessons learned for COIN and security forces around the world. Dr. Joe Felcher is a William J. Perry Fellow at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. From 2017 to 2019, Dr. Felter served as U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Oceania. He is the co-director of the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project and the co-author of Small Wars, Big Data, The Information Revolution and Modern Conflict. Dr. Felter retired as a colonel from the U.S. Army's Special Forces. Dennis Aclaren is a retired colonel in the Republic of the Philippines Scout Ranger Regiment. After decades serving in elite combat roles, Colonel Claren directed the Training Development Center of the Philippine Army's Training and Doctrine Command, where he played a lead role in analyzing data and implementing the findings of the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project's efforts in the Philippines. Colonel Claren is the author of several books on Philippine insurgency and counterinsurgency forces, including Scout Ranger War Stories and Philippine Rebel Stories. You are listening to the Irregular Warfare Podcast, a joint production of the Princeton Empirical Studies of Conflict Project and the Modern War Institute at West Point, dedicated to bridging the gap between scholars and practitioners to support the community of irregular warfare professionals. Here is our conversation with Joe and Dennis. Joe, Dennis, thank you for being here today. We've really been looking forward to this discussion, and I know it's also a great reunion for the two of you. Thanks, Sean and Nick, and thanks for all you're doing. This is a great initiative, and it's uh, just really great to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to help. So, Joe, to start with you, the breadth of your experience working Philippine counterinsurgency efforts has spanned your career. You've served as a special forces team leader. You've built counterterrorism forces from the ground up. You've been the senior military attache and eventually served at the the policy level as a DASD, in addition to the academic research that you've done to study Philippine counterinsurgency. How do you distill decades of historical and political context in a manner that helps us understand how we should approach Philippine security issues? Yeah, sure. Uh, fortunately for researchers and those studying insurgency, the Philippines is just a very rich case. Now, the downside is, you know, the Philippines has suffered and endured long-running insurgencies for, you know, literally for centuries. But you think about it, they have very separate and distinct long-running insurgencies. Uh, you know, the separatist uh, challenges there literally began when, I would say, when Magellan showed up back in the 1500s and said, hey, uh, what do you think about Christianity? And uh, some, some of the Filipinos didn't take so kindly to that. And there have been a groups, uh, certainly down in the southern Philippines, the island of Mindanao, that have been struggling to have their own form of Muslim identity and, and avoid assimilation into a, a very Christian state. Uh, then you've got a long-running communist insurgency, uh, maybe early roots in the Huck Rebellion, but certainly in the late 60s uh, with the New People's Army, the Communist People's Party. So long-running communist insurgency. And then you've got a, what I would call maybe bundle up extremist groups. Obviously, F Group, for example, and, and more recently, uh, ISIS, which we saw some of the devastating uh, activities of ISIS down, down in Morale in the southern Philippines. Then you've got these criminal groups, and then you've got a lot of gray areas. One day, uh, someone might identify as obviously F Group, the next day they might be more uh, as, as a separatist, as an MIL effort, for example. So long-running insurgencies in the Philippines Philippines with very separate and distinct motives really provide us an opportunity to study so much about the, about the Philippines. So Dennis, given what you've experienced in your decades as a scout ranger, when did the coordinated military response to insurgency in the Philippines begin? Is this something that's manifested in the post 9-11 era or did it start earlier? 
Yeah, yeah, much much earlier because the insurgency here has been multi generational. Uh, 1950s to 1957, that was the height of the Hook Balahap rebellion. And then we quashed that. And starting 1969, that was like the second wave of insurgency here with the separatists and the insurgents, communist insurgents. And since then, we are on our 51st year of solid counterinsurgency here in the Philippines. Well, given that, would you characterize the counterinsurgency strategy as being very military heavy or as having more of a whole of government and whole of society approach? Yeah, we've tried very hard to involve the entire society to help in the counterinsurgency. But during the early stages of the insurgency, no, not too many are we- were willing to help because they were directly threatened by the rebels. Local officials would not cooperate because if they cooperated, their family members would get killed. Village leaders would not cooperate for the same reasons. NGOs would not help. So for at least two decades, the, the Philippine military almost had it alone doing the counterinsurgency work. But now we are starting to form coalitions with NGOs and with other government organizations. But most importantly, some of these local government officials or who were like fence sitters who did not really want to help because, you know, they would be threatened physically or, or their businesses would be closed or their political uh, support will be threatened by the rebels. They're now starting to embrace the mili- Philippine military counterinsurgency approaches. However, their their support is not permanent. I mean, they, they, they could swing any time because, again, because of the presence of the rebel threat at any time. Because when we leave, the rebels are still there. But in that way, we have been, we have been making some progress, but not as much, though. And, and Dennis, if I, could, if I could follow up with that, when did the, the U.S. military start providing advisory assistance and what did that look like? Well, you will see at the Hoover Center the diaries between Colonel Lansdale and our former president, Magsaysay. Colonel Lansdale was a guy who, just mag guy who advised President Magsaysay how to quash the Hook Rebellion in the 1950s. So regarding counterinsurgency, that was, that was the start in the early 1950s. And then up to now, uh, you guys are still here. And, and, uh, you know, we had a, a war in the Philippines at the turn of the century. Some people characterize it as America's first Vietnam. So not quite the uh, an insurgency, but it's very, uh, very much in the memory of the Filipinos. And many Americans don't really appreciate that we actually fought a, a pretty bloody campaign in the Philippines and occupied the country. And it later became a, our province. And that's just important history to, to understand for context. But American security interests were very different in that war than today. So why has the U.S. been so invested in Philippine counterterrorism, counterinsurgency efforts over the past two decades? What are those contemporary security interests? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a bigger question. And, and, you know, I'm a friend of the Philippines, but for, on a number of levels, one is certainly the nature of transnational terrorism. You know, if, 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 if you can get safe haven in, in a cave in Afghanistan and plot to do us harm, you know, there's safe havens in, in other areas to include the Philippines. So, uh, you know, this is a transnational threat. And so we need to be concerned about it wherever it may manifest itself or be allowed to manifest itself. But, but this is where, you know, I may mean, reveal my affinity for the U.S.-Philippine relationship. You know, this is a treaty ally. This is someone who's literally gone to bat with us. I mean, you know some of the stories back in World War II with, with Philippine civilians literally list, risking their life and losing their life to, to provide aid and comfort for Americans and getting killed by the Japanese because of it. But this is a this is a long, close relationship. You know, when I served in the, in the Defense Department, uh, Secretary James Mattis would say, you know, alliances don't stay the same. They get better or worse based on how much you invest in it. Can you explain then how that investment has manifested in the structure and application of Philippine coin forces? Sure. The special operations forces within, if you will, in the, in the Philippines, uh, I would say the, the lead members are the Philippine Army Scout Ranger Regiment, the first Scout Ranger Regiment. We have a special forces regiment on the Army side. Uh, and then the, the Navy does have a, the equivalent of Navy SEALs, a special SWAG. What, Dennis, help me out. The Special Warfare Operations Group, is that this? Yeah, yes, sir, yeah. So there's an, and then there's a, some Air Force components, but that's how it's configured. And, you know, historically, the Philippine military was modeled to some degree after the U.S. I mean, again, as a, as a former colony, and we, we've been working with the Philippine military for some time. So structurally, they, they did look so many ways similar to the United States military. I don't think he mentioned that he's the co-founder of the Light Reaction Regiment now here, which... Uh, won the Marawi siege 
in 2017 against the, yeah, the, against the ISIS-inspired group. So that was his enduring contribution to the Philippines. So Joe, can you tell us a little bit about that? How you were involved and, and what was the motivation behind uh, the project? No, sure. And, and uh, a lot of people were involved in this. And I had a, just a real privilege to work with some amazing people. Uh, but this is going, think about, uh, this is in the Philippines 2000. We, we just had a uh, uh, a major international hostage situation where several Americans were taken hostage. The Burnhams, for example, uh, um, I think this was back in 2000. Other international hostages and certainly Filipino hostages. But certainly there was a, a, a heightened awareness that, wow, there's there's groups in the Philippines that threaten our interest. And there was a, a recognition that, wow, we, we should really work with our, our partner, our treaty ally, the Philippines, to help build their counterterrorist capabilities. Admittedly, while they've got, they had some good counterterrorism forces, we thought that we had an opportunity with some U.S training and resources, we might be able to raise the bar of Philippine counterterrorist capabilities. But this is pre-9-11, and, and Dennis, remember this. There was interest, but not nearly the overwhelming enthusiasm for developing counterterrorism forces. So we had to uh, be a bit creative. We ended up getting the state coordinator for counterterrorism, Ambassador Mike Sheehan, who's just extraordinary, committed to, to providing some initial seed money. End up with the Philippine Special Operations Command commander, General uh, Dionisio Santiago worked with him, and he had t- some members of his staff. We got together, and, and I, we literally were having a, a, a Sam Adams beer at my place in Makati, uh, talking about, "Hey, how can we help the Philippines build its capabilities?" That's where the best problem solving happens over well, Sam Adams. Yeah, yeah. So we s- sketched out a plan, but then there's a whole lot of challenges get, get, getting uh, support for it. But this uh, this one individual, we were just three, you know, mid grade officers at uh, Ted Yamas, a uh, Tata Sievert. And, and some other uh, scout rangers and at the staff level that work for General Santiago. But we came up with a plan. And uh, again, there's a lot went into this. We, we got the U.S. support. We found the right place for it at the Philippine uh, Special Operations Command. We drew from the scout rangers and, and the special forces and put together what was called a light reaction company. Again, this is pre-9-11, although we had hostages there. But boy, after 9-11, the interest just skyrocketed for Philippine counterterrorist capabilities and then eventually brought, brought you a, you know, just sort of P and, and other efforts to, to help build, build the capabilities. But early days, it was a handful of us, I think, recognizing that, that this close treaty partner, the Philippines, we had a shared interest in, in helping build its capabilities to, to uh, interdict terrorism threats. And uh, we worked closely together at the first special forces battalion under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Maxwell and Major uh, Max Carpenter came down and just did an extraordinary job training that first cohort of, of, of this combined scout ranger special forces uh the light reaction company, if you will. But, you know, I would say an interesting part of this emphasis was this wasn't about giving them high speed gear. It wasn't about giving them, you know, MP- MP5s and, and advanced communications and equipment, although that was part of it. Uh, the big emphasis, it was on the training. You know, let's develop leadership and, and training at the small unit level. And we, we really wanted to commit the majority of our resources was to training. We, we built a shoot house up at Fort, Fort McSaisai. And, and these uh, this light reaction company, Extraordinary. Uh, they, they work close together. We, they train closer together and they became a really powerful asset for, for the Philippine military and uh, hence grew a bit to, to a regiment. Had to contend with all the same challenges that our own special forces do with quality versus quantity, and, but, but they, they struck that balance. So there are two things that, that stand out about that story to me. The first is the interagency approach to building out the light reaction company and the initial support from the State Department pre 9 11. Secondly, is that almost two decades later, the organization that you helped stand up uh, was crucial in the fight against ISIS in the Battle of Marawi in 2017. What more can you share with us about the training that the Light Reaction Company received and what really what made it successful, especially against ISIS in the, in the Battle of Marawi? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you, you mentioned early days. And, you know, I'm out of the Army. I'm out of the DOD as of this year, so I could be a little more candid. I'm not exactly going to point any fingers, but I'll admit, I, I, in 2000, when we had Americans held hostage, I would have hoped that may, maybe our Defense Department and the military options would have been more uh, quickly forthcoming. But, you know, getting funds for something new, and, and, and to, uh, it's, it's understandably challenging. Then that we we really uh, got, got an ally on the State Department side, but but not to fund forever. Maybe get, get some seed resource in there to get it going, and uh, and certainly then the DoD stepped in big time after after nine eleven and, and helping to stand up the, the Jesota. So well, uh, they they recovered nicely. But those first months, I really give a lot of credit to to, to Ambassador Sheehan and and really to General Santiago at Philippine SOCOM. But it was a bunch of us field grade 
officers getting together and, and identifying a need and working together and, and presenting it to, to the senior leadership in ways that they could get their head around and, get, and, and support both on the Philippines and, and the U.S. side. I think it was a real positive outcome that benefits itself today. And, and Nick, shift into your question about ISIS. It's a small unit enterprise, you know, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. You know, when you're <laughs> On the counterterrorism side, when, when you're kicking in a door in, in, in Marawi in a high threat area, it's, it comes down to the training and discipline and proficiency of that small team. And you don't just spin that up. You don't buy it. It takes lots of training, lots of discipline, lots of focused resources. And, and uh, to, to the Philippines' credit, I, certainly with the, within the Light Reaction Regiment, that's exactly what they focused on. Dennis, how was this received by the Scout Rangers and by the Philippine government? I mean, this seems like some pretty substantive organizational change, and you're doing it through collaboration between two partner nations, which could have encountered a certain level of resistance. Yeah, well, I think I have to highlight um, the particular skill set that Special Forces Officer, you know, then Major Felter really possessed to be able to organize this thing because I think he succeeded in where where some other U.S. officers or units have failed, which is to rally a certain idea, pedal it to his friends here, and then create a, a lasting unit out of it. I think there's some interpersonal skill that he possessed, which I like to highlight because I don't think the Light Reaction Regiment would have been established had he not had those close relationships Mm -hmm. because especially at that nascent stage where everything was still being uh, formed and forged and the fringe and then you know just just putting it in the mainstream is the biggest challenge maintaining Mm -hmm. a unit after it is in the mainstream is really very easy because all you need is resources and putting all those mainstream people there uh, you know doing their job but the greatest challenge, which I also do, especially here in the Philippines, is, is rallying people to embrace an idea, which I think is the hardest part that any special forces officer, especially in, in host nations, would have to contend with. But I, I imagine it's interesting, too, because in your context, there's a great motivation for wanting to find a solution because it's where you live. This conflict is happening in your backyard. Did that affect the willingness to move forward on these initiatives? Yeah, 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 of course, of course. I mean, we, we needed to to quash the terrorists here, but I don't think it would have gotten to a good start without without the assistance of Kenneth Felter and his team. Sean, I might riff on that comment a bit. And, and gosh, I know we've been in two decades of conflict and, and seen some extraordinary hardship for, for our military. You get the Philippines, you realize they, they literally are... <laughs> In combat, they're, they're, it's conflict their entire career. They've known nothing but, and and you know, there's not this notion of low intensity conflict, small wars, limited wars. You guys both know that there's nothing low intensity about a conflict when you're in it. And Dennis, he was commissioned, you're out of West Point, and then going back to at a time when you know it was pretty quiet days in the U.S. military, no one was thinking about going to war, but he always had in the back of his mind that he's going to go back and, and literally fight for his entire career, especially in the units he was serving in. And this is to your point, Sean, about in their backyard, they've been fighting their whole career and and it's very real to them. You just can't overstate the long-term challenges and stress that the Armed Forces of the Philippines uh, has endured with these long-running insurgencies. And I think it's hard for the United States, maybe even in in these long wars we've been in, to really appreciate what it's like to to be constantly at war. We don't have tours. (laughs) You guys have tours, right? (laughs) We don't have tours. We get to come home, you know, we we take off at the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we, Kevlar. we yeah 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 we count our our, our service uh in five years <laughs> so first long pay second long pay third long pay and it's all it's all combat <laughs> you're lucky if you're like get get back into headquarters so yeah that's the difference so dennis one of the things i, I found really interesting is you started talking about the attributes of an effective counterinsurgency advisor and one of the things that you, you pointed out about the then major felter was what seemed like empathy, the the ability to build relationships and understand where the where the partner force is coming from. Are there any other attributes that you could point out that were effective or otherwise throughout your military career that you saw of, of advisors? Novel ideas are resisted by mainstream people. Like when you start thinking you're like, okay, this 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 might work. The initial reaction is like, no, it won't work. I think one of the unsung (laughs) characteristics of an effective special forces officer, advisor in in countries like this is 
you know, knowing that you will encounter a lot of resistance and you are going to do your very best to conquer all, all, all those resistance. That will give you the respect of people. That's why he's still much respected up to now. He he received the he received. Hey, sir, you you got like the special blah blah right award when <laughs> during the anniversary. No, I, I get that special blah blah award. Yeah. Thing. Thank you. yeah, 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 yeah. He was he was awarded for being the co-founder of of the unit and like oh see because I can empathize and sympathize with the challenges that one faces when you are doing something very novel. You know, all militaries are big bureaucracies. All you know, it's it's hard to step out of line and, and be on the fringe, as Dennis described. Uh, and I would say, you know, in the Philippines, there is just a lot of pressure to conform, you know, to fall in line with the chain of command, just like in the U.S. military. But you know, to address threats like we're talking about today, you know, terrorism and assertive, it's it's you got to think creative, you got to think out of the box. But I think the penalties for thinking out of the box maybe even stiffer in the Philippines than they were in in the U.S., where I felt that we were tolerated a bit certain special operations community. There's some really incredibly forward-thinking uh, officers there, you know, Dennis being one of them, Ted Yamas, I mentioned, who, who was the Light Reaction Regiment commander and others. I think institutionally, I, I'd like to see some of those big idea, mid-grade officers become general officers. Some of them do, but it, but it's there's some penalties for being on the fringe. Well, I think the additional layer here and what makes your story so compelling is that you did not stop at the operational experience. You decided to look at this through a different lens. Together, you collaborated on a very substantive research project that sought to identify the real nuances of what makes an effective counterinsurgency force. Joe, how did this project start and what were you trying to solve? Sure. The project started for me, I was trying to get a, a PhD dissertation done in, in uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so I need to leverage some of my field time, if you will, uh, in the military. I ended up by working with David Layton and James Fearon, who, who had just published a really similar article called Ethnicity, Insurgency, and Civil War in, in the American Political Science Review. I think this is 2003. Uh, the piece said, hey, uh, state capacity matters. It's not just, uh, you know, grievances predict you know, whether you're going to see civil wars and insurgency. Those conditions are ubiquitous. That, that in fact, it's really the capacities of, of the, the military and police forces of a state. So my, my motivation was, well, I think that small unit level characteristics can predict variation in military effectiveness and counterinsurgency. And this was kind of like my intuition. But anyway, the challenge was, was getting data. And this is where I, you know, I was very fortunate. And Dennis mentioned some of the relationships. I, I went to the Philippines hoping to find a way to test this. So when you came up with this idea, did you know that there was data available that you could use no. to the question? I knew it was out there, but I didn't know if I could get it. And I'll just tell that the vignette was, and this goes back to our West Point connection, but I was literally invited over to the, the home of the chief of staff of the armed forces, General Narciso Abai, who was a, 19, a class of 1971 West Point graduate. And I developed a relationship. And the Philippines are wonderful in many ways. And one is that they really value their their alumni connections. As a West Point in the Philippines, you have you know just have this great access to this amazing group of uh, alumni. But was able to eat with him. And I, and I talked about, hey, General Biden, sir, I'm trying to learn about the Philippines uh, what, what makes units effective in counterinsurgency with, with and, and the policy relevant implications or how can we can develop more effective counterinsurgency forces? And I told him the types of data I needed. And he pulled out his cell phone and said he called up his J3, his operations officers. Hey, I'm sitting here with Major Joe Felter. Um, he's a friend of mine. Uh, you know, I'm going to send him over to see you tomorrow. And can, can you help with his research? And, and that was when I that's when I knew I was going to finish a dissertation. <laughs> it was all or nothing. And coming up with the findings were not shocking. That high quality the troops operating with good information tended to perform better on, on multiple dimensions. And that indiscriminate actions that kill or, or, or harm civilians, that they're going to undermine your ability to conduct effective counterinsurgency. Dennis, how did you get roped into this effort? We met because somebody, one of his friends, uh, his co-founder in the Light Reaction Regiment, recommended me uh, way back. I think 2007, and he was doing his stuff then, this study of his, which had been like three or four years in the making when we met. Yeah, and then uh, we started working on, on his data set because I was then the director of the training development center at the Training Doctrine Command. And after that, we, we have been working for like how many years now? Almost a decade. Yeah, so, yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah, but I've, I've loved working on this data set because nobody has really touched it before. Uh, even the Philippines has not really even cared looking at it. So it's good that we finally got to tabulate and study in some detail the experiences. The real big epiphany was going back with Dennis and, and what that, that four-year trove became like a 30-year trove thanks to Dennis's intervention. And 
Um, but this is, and again, this is where Dennis uh, put together a team of coders, uh, largely uh, Philippine uh, military non-commissioned officers, because the restriction I had was we can't take this out of the headquarters, but we can code certain fields that, that are deemed not, not too sensitive. So this is what he stood up an entire coding. I mean, these guys were working on their, their off-duty time, often through the night. So now we can tell the story of Philippines counterinsurgency going back to 1975 in a very granular way. So you had this gut instinct, you had this gut instinct that, hey, small units with great leaders, with effective training, uh, and access to local information, that's going to lead to effective results in a counterinsurgency campaign. Um, and then you couple that with a partner nation force with locally recruited soldiers. And, and that's what, that, what that's effectiveness, essentially. Um, so I guess my first question, is that an accurate characterization of, of your findings? Uh, and then the second is, did anything surprise you as you started running this data set and working with Dennis? <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's always a surprise working with Dennis, but we found that when local forces worked with highly trained, highly professional cadres like the special forces, that was kind of the sweet spot. That was the, the efficient sweet spot where I, I call the cadres kind of adult supervision, if you will, because these local forces, what they bring to the table is they know the community. They, they know what, what's going on, you know, who's who's saying what, who's doing what. But for a range of reasons, they, they may not be the most disciplined or, or professional or, or trained. and But the, w- one of the findings uh, was, and this is kind of, you know, at the height of the Iraq and Afghan uh, challenge when I, when I wrote this initially was, you know, maybe, you know, if you're familiar with like the Afghan local police and those things, but it was kind of validating this notion that let's take local forces and let, let's bring specially trained elite or specially trained professional cadres and combine them. And that's going to be a, an efficient combination for effective counter-surgery. And then, but the Philippines gave us this great opportunity to test the capabilities and effectiveness of, of counterinsurgency forces against different distinct rebel threats. A communist Interesting. insurgent is very different than a you know a separatist insurgent. In the case of the Philippines, let's say it was a, a moral national liberation front rebel fighting at the height of the war in, in the 70s versus a you know a communist guerrilla. When you're fighting the communists, for example, this this goes back to, to work I did with you know, Jake Shapiro and Ellie Berman on really how insurgency it is. It's kind of a three-player game, you know, the rebels and the government and the civilians, and you're really kind of competing for information from the civilians. And, and and, and when you're fighting the MPA, that's very much uh, fits that model. Whereas if it's in the balance, the insurgents of the local population are which side of the fence am I going to fall on? And, and your, your actions are very consequential as a counterinsurgent as far as discrimination, civilian abuse, aid and services. They all kind of impact. Whereas some, some areas, if you're down in the southern Philippines, maybe you're not going to get local information. So, so, so maybe your investments may be in more on the uh, the government force side where, where you're going to have to sadly maybe pursue more conventional means to, to advance your interests. So. Well, the findings sound significant because they appear to indicate that building partner capacity can actually improve coin outcomes. Dennis, how did these findings resonate within the Philippine Armed Forces? Is this something that was expected based on what you saw in practice? There were no surprises from uh, the results. Because, I mean, everybody knew that you really need well-trained and well-led, you know, units to follow through on these rebel forces. So I think this finding really fits more, and especially during the early build-up stages of an insurgency where there's like really massive recruitment, massive movement of force, uh, enemy forces. This this particular finding really, really works. But when the uh, insurgency kind of tapers down to, to a level where there are not too many enemy forces and they're so ingrained in society doing revolutionary taxation, that's another level of uh, warfare uh, that of course, the, the findings of Kennerfelter would still be applicable, but it takes a different uh, skill set again when you try to like really kill an insurgency that's so deep rooted, that's even more efficient than the government in taxing the people. That's the biggest challenge of, of quashing an insurgency. You know, and Dennis, I recall talking to some of the senior leaders, that sometimes it's the findings can help reinforce budget decisions. You know, when we know that maybe better equipment or a ship or a fighter is not necessarily going to translate into better internal security. And there's a whole lot that goes into it. But I know Dennis helped me with this, but it was able to come out and brief some of the senior officers as they try to develop, you know, where, where their budget priorities are. But uh, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's kind of squishy to invest in training. I'd rather get something I can shoot. And we found this with the Light Reaction Company. And once they bought into it, and they became great believers in the value of that. But there is a tendency, not just in the Philippines, but if you have a 
resources to spend. You want to you want to get some pieces of equipment, but but these findings really acknowledge how important the development of the human capital, the kind of research. Let, let me let me add on that, sir, because the findings of that one, I was still in the trading and doctrine command then. And based on these findings, we really ramped up the redesign of our curriculum to put a more a sharper sharper edge. Uh, among our officers and enlisted personnel, because previously we have been focusing on on on, on subjects like military correspondence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and not not like really the real stuff that that win wars. So yeah, that was one of the major contributions of this finding. It even got to the Mil- Philippine Military Academy because I also was the one that designed their curriculum. So I in- also inputted these findings from Kenner Felter study. But, but I tell you, it was, a, it was a tough crowd briefing, like the Philippine uh, division commanders and brigade commanders. Yeah, I knew their boss, but they were like, what's this American, you know, showing up with these academic findings telling us how to fight our wars? You know, a lot of the case studies that we have looked at, there, there was a, a major focus on tactical and operational level capability development, but a lack in institutional level advising. It seems like your research helped the institution reorient and invest in human capital. And if I'm understanding Dennis correctly from the training and doctrine side, there were there were some effects at the institutional level from this research project. Yep. Yeah, I'll defer to Dennis on that. that that's right, hoped. And then there were some examples of that, and, and Dennis highlighted a few, but it was... Uh... Yeah. yeah, so, well, it, it, you know, as an offshoot of our my relationship with Kenner Felter, uh, I got to do several documentaries of uh, four decades of insurgents in the Philippines. So we got to interview around 1500 people and the three sides of the counter of the insurgency coin i in- interviewed uh, at least 500 rebels from the 1950s up to 2015 i interviewed around 500 of our key military officers from the 1950s up to now and i interviewed more or less around 500 leaders from from this uh, from from the society mayors governors cabinet ministers, etc., and tried to, you know, bring this cohesive view of, okay, how they perceive the insurgency is, was, or is. And it's quite enlightening because, I mean, from the perspectives of these people, insurgency can be, is, is avoidable if there's only strong government and uh, sincerity in, in every public servant to run a corrupt, free government, which we don't have. So, yeah. I mean, we still have that. And actually, Kenneth Felter and I are planning to donate those uh, solid, solid interviews. I don't know how many thousands of hours to, to the Hoover Institute. Yeah. Dennis, I'd like to follow up on your interviews with the rebel forces, because that is certainly a unique perspective when analyzing coin effectiveness. From those interviews, what did you glean from the rebel force in terms of what they saw as effective in Filipino counterinsurgency units? Okay, uh, from the combat perspective, uh, they know uh, they fear they fear the scout rangers, and and I mean I think the the data shows that we have consistently you know scored against them on a much higher basis uh, than normal infantry forces. They hated it when the counterinsurgency forces designed counterinsurgency methods that really blocked their advance as far as the evolution of their of their tactics is concerned. Um, they also hated it when we also employed guides, uh, local guides, and this is where the information thing that. Kenner Felter study points out because much of our successes here, I would say when you have a guide that volunteers to guide you where the labor, rebel camp is, 90%, 95% you're going to figure in, an, in a violent clash because they know the terrain, they know, you know, they know the secret paths, etc. But the rebel forces were just laughing at ordinary units, ordinary infantry unit, who did not know anything about where the location was. Like, you know, these search and destroy things, you know, it never works. They never work. Without information, any patrol will never work. You will tend to get exhausted. You you can be mined. 
it's not worth anything. It's just useless use uh, use of resources. What's very important is like precision operations led by local locals. That's the formula that we found to be very interesting, very effective. And you and you found that conventional forces were unable to get that local information and to get those local guys. Yes, yes. Although I would not discount, there are also excellent combat leaders in the conventional forces who, by their long association, one or two or three years in the locality, would gain friends, gain the trust of people, and start getting nice tips from friends. Dennis, I want to follow up on something that you said that was rather fascinating, which was that rebels could not stand certain methods that counterinsurgency forces employed. Other than using local guides, what were those methods that really got to the rebels? Uh, one of the, as, as the data shows, many, many of the surrenderies, rebel surrenderies come out after really intense campaigns, intense military campaigns, like bombings, uh, like uh, solid coordinated, not not small unit campaigns, but in the battalions and brigades. It's when you exert that intense military pressure that they cannot find food, they cannot find shelter, they're so scared. And then when you start offering them a chance to walk away from the rebel movement, they do that. The data shows that. But the data also shows that during these tense times when they are contemplating and surrendering, money matters. It's when the government offers them livelihood and cash for their firearms, do the wrong rank and file, consider leaving the movement. But what you will find interesting in our data, especially the rebel data, which we also coded, is that not too many of their top leadership ever surrender. And the reason why is because they're making money, so much money from the rebel movement. So that's 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 uh, that's my key finding there. So your characterization of the data and findings of this project were essentially maximum pressure involved with violence, uh, and that coupled with opportunities for a livelihood outside of the conflict, really offered opportunity to the rank and file whether that's, you know, monetary considerations or otherwise, that's what drew them out of the insurgency. However, the caveat is that with the leadership, the top leadership, because they really were making a livelihood out of the conflict, they never surrendered. Is that correct? Yep, yep, yep. And that's where you use assassinations and all those other, uh, you know, all those other methods to get this really at the top leaders. Interesting. So a leadership targeting yeah. type uh, type tactic, if you yeah. will. Yeah, we'll, we'll use different words in our military, but you you, you gotta. Yeah. They they use their own. <laughs> same same <laughs> <in adult. laughs> Leadership yeah, targeting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever yeah. you call it. <laughs> so yeah. speaking of methods, Joe, how are these findings applicable to counterinsurgency efforts outside of the Philippines? Yeah. So you know, given the counterinsurgency and internal security operations, it's it's really a local struggle, really a local enterprise. The more and better quality microdata we have, the, the more that that data can be relevant and, and the findings can be relevant to you know other conditions. So I'm hoping that this uh this micro conflict data set going back to nineteen seventy five, uh, you know, hopefully it'll 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 help inform and test hypothesis for, for a range of a range of other other cases. So yeah, I, I am uh, I'm optimistic that it's going to be a, a data set that, that that scholars can use to study many other cases of, of conflict in, in around the world. So real quick, Joe, to follow up on that, with the cyber domain and access to information expanding, do you think your findings with this data set and research will change? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, tech technology is going to be it's going to be interesting. You know, going back to some of the a joint work with Jake Shapiro and Oli Berman, how you get information, how you get it and how you transmit it is certainly being affected by technology. You know, some, some recent research as far as like, just imagine what cell phones have done as far as the information uh, access and, and, and transfer. Information is always going to be important, but how, how you get it and transmit it could, could change with, with technology, but certainly it will remain important. And I do think uh, the quality of forces now, uh, you're going to be able to leverage technology better. I, I would imagine that a, a higher quality force. And there's been some work on this as well. So I think investments in the human capital of the counterinsurgents, I think, is going to be a 
important, even as, as technology changes and the nature of warfare changes. Some of the principles are going to be enduring as far as quality forces and, and importance of information. Um, and, and you're still going to be human, despite AI, there's going to be humans in the loop. They're going to have to make a decision. Appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, Dennis, in the Philippines, a lot of things have changed in the past couple years with the security situation with just relationships. Since this project started and since you started looking at this data, how are things different now? Are, are the threats the same? Are the way you approach them the same? Um, do you anticipate different types of threats coming into play now? No, it's the same thing. I mean, there's a the China factor, but it's largely an external issue in the South China Sea. What remains is we still have this internal situation where we have to contend with but we have brought the numbers of the insurgents to their lowest, I guess, in several decades. But it's like we can never seem to quash the whole thing. So that's the next level uh, is now. And much of it's like, uh, you know, those in the active service now are really experimenting and, and information operations, social media operations. But insurgency is so complicated when you cannot root out their source of uh, finances and logistics. Hey, Sean, let me, let me expand a bit on that question. One challenge now, you know, I, I just left OSD policy where our national defense strategy is, the tagline is, you know, we're in long-term competition with Russia and China. Many would argue much less emphasis on the threats we've been focusing on the last 20 years. But I would say we, we, a, a bit of caution. Some, some might say, hey, well, this research was so last couple of decades, this great power competition is back. But you know, I remember it when I was a West Point cadet, a, a major Dave Petraeus I had in class who was commuting down to Princeton to get his PhD done. And it came to light that he was, his dissertation was on the lessons from Vietnam. And we're thinking like, God, that is so like 1975. And we're fighting the fighting the Soviets. Who cares about that? You know, fast forward, and I'm part of his team helping uh, with, well, we didn't have a counterinsurgency doctrine when we finally, uh, or man, when we realized we're fighting an insurgency in Iraq. And, and he had to kind of give it the big I told you so and lead that FM. 324 effort. But I say it because let's not, the, the lessons that we learn from studying insurgency, counterinsurgency, the less the, the hypothesis we can test with, with the kind of quality data that this is an example of, and there, there's others, it's, it's going to be relevant. We can't just wish away the threat. It's even in an era of great power competition. And you remember in the Cold War, the actual shooting wars were, the adversary was the USSR and China in some respect, but the, the, the actual conflicts were we're unconventional. We're, we're small wars. We're limited wars. So I think we really need to discipline ourselves and make sure that we, we still study this type of conflict. We, we learn those lessons because the stakes are high. I mean, it's literally life and death. And if we uh, if we put it behind us, you know, we're going to see these fights again. And, and we're going to need to understand how to fight it more effectively, more efficiently. And, uh, and hopefully the, this, this reservoir of data that, that we've collected will be an enduring resource in, in that end. So I, I want to I want to jump on uh, one common thread that, that you just mentioned, Joe, and then Dennis as well, uh, and that's you know great power competition, and then China's influence internally and externally in in the Philippines. Uh, so how has that been affecting security considerations in the Philippines? And and Dennis, it'd be great to, great to start with you. Yeah, well. Okay, if we look at the future now, with China really, really exerting a lot of influence in our, you know, in the Philippine society, actually, because uh, they have invested so much already. In, uh, they now control the third telecoms player that we have. They control our national grid. They control the South China Sea with their bases in 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 the islands of Palawan. I mean, they have like a lot of clandestine operators now here. So in this part of the world, there's still some... China hasn't gotten the hearts and minds of the Filipinos as much as the Americans have, as much as you have. However, the greatly diminished presence of American forces and uh, added to it is the abhorrence of our president in anything American, I think, which is kind of, you know, it, there's not too much attention now in U.S. military assistance, which I hope, I hope those could be repaired because it takes a long time to build relationships, but it takes like just a few months or even days or weeks to destroy one. I'll try to be a little more optimistic than Dennis, maybe, maybe naively so. Yes, you're absolutely right, Dennis, that we we, we can lose 
uh, the relationship we've, we've built, spent so much time on, but maybe not right away. With, with those decades of investment, um, they're still going to work in our favor. I, I look at China, it's it, the relationship with China. I mean, let's be honest, uh, you know, we, we still have a vision that, that is shared by, by the Philippines and other countries in the region. You know, we want a free and open Indo Pacific region, you know, rules based order to continue. And then that vision is embraced by people. You know, we're not perfect, but we we we, we tend to share the same vision for the future for our families and, and posterity. China, it's it, their vision has to be imposed, coerced, co-opted. Um, you know, the, yes, they're very good at, at transactional behavior where they can buy support, they can bribe uh, to their way to, they can throw money. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, if you're getting close to China, do you expect? How can you expect China to treat you any better than they treat their own people? And and I think for anyone to look at China and say that's the horse I want to hitch my wagon to, I, I just don't I don't think so. We are so close culturally, you know. The Philippines and the United States are are I don't know of a closer uh, relationship with any other country really. I think as long as we respect Philippine sovereignty, but then really leverage. I mean, I say leverage not in a inappropriate, but really draw on that close relationship, that recognition that we have shared values, shared interests and a shared vision for the future, and that, that we're going to work together and keep investing in that relationship. And a lot of it just comes down to respect, respect their sovereignty and work with them. Uh, and then, then it goes both ways. I think uh, you know, the Philippines needs to just appreciate that the commitment the U.S. has. And we can't take it for granted. And, and, it, and we've got to make sure that we earn that, that relationship going forward with, with continued investment. So, Dennis, a question for you. Given your decades of experience in the Army and working with the counterinsurgency problem set, what lessons have you picked up across your career that you could share with COIN practitioners uh, number one, I'd be very biased. Support the elite forces because it's the elite forces who have that champion mindset to kill or be killed to win at all costs. And training, human resources, mm-hmm. equipment, etc., those are really needed. And most importantly for these elite forces, it's the, really the quality of leadership that matters. So it's in filtering out, it's in choosing the best yeah, number two is really in the training of the military officers and especially, and also for the NCOs. Much of our training has been patterned up on, on U.S. trade doc, I think, curriculum, which is more on the war fighting thing. I, I remember like be, no, do, whatever that is. It's not effective here because it's so narrow in its treatment of the skills needed for counterinsurgency uh, operations especially in a mature insurgency situation. That's why when I got tapped to redesign the curriculum of the Philippine Military Academy, the redesign the curriculum of uh, the NCO development, officer development, I advocated the simultaneous development of the roles that a military officer or NCO must have. One is he must be a leader of character. Number two, is that he must be he must uh, be a partner in nation building number 3 of course he must be a war fighter but those are the key three things because what was not included and what was just taken for granted in our education is our responsibilities for nation building because that's like an entirely different mindset apart from our being uh, war fighters and i think to be successful counterinsurgency operators, we must have a solid grasp of what nation building skills are needed. That's my conviction. I appreciate that. Joe, I'd like to turn to you for one last question. Your perspective is extremely unique as well because you've seen this type of problem set from the tactical level all the way to the strategic and policy level and everything in between. And you've also dealt with it from the realm of academia. You've researched it. What are the implications of your professional experience and your research for policymakers in terms of dealing with counterinsurgency? Yeah. So first, I think it's important to get involved. And there's a symbiotic relationship between research and policymakers. There needs to be a bridge. You know, there's much to be learned. The operator can learn much from the academic and, and vice versa. So, so the, but the academic needs to be grounded in operations and reality, if you will. So, but, but I encourage uh, both to continue to, to work and, and, and get closer to, you know, a better understanding because the stakes are so high. But certainly, uh, you know, what we try to do with ESOC is really you know, break down some barriers, create more opportunities for, you know, to get our best and, and brightest academics working on these tough problems. And then also build the rapport on the operator side to welcome this. You know, I remember working in, in Kabul, bringing in uh, these professors to talk to General McChrystal, General Petraeus, and, and uh, Sergeant Major may have bristled a little bit when uh, we walked them in. But uh, 
But then you hear them talk like, wow, they, they bring something to the table. They add value. They look funny in their, their Kevlar and they can't wear a helmet straight, but uh, they can provide some insights that some of those grizzly veteran soft operators just really hadn't had the time or inclination to, to maybe find. And then both ways, to, to encourage an appreciation amongst academics who I have great respect for that, hey, it's it's not just about the three stars on the regression and, and never forget that, that those data points. And, and, you know, this is a part of our the book. That I, it was a it was a scene with, with Dennis. We were coding these reports and one of uh, Dennis's coding team came across an incident report that. He remembered someone he knew was killed, and it's very real. These ticks on an Excel spreadsheet, these aren't just dependent variable. These are people with families and and friends. So let's remember that the stakes are high and even more motivation for scholars to work on these tough issues. Because, boy, if we can learn more about conflict, maybe help our operators or policymakers understand how to reduce the horrific cost of these conflicts. And, boy, that's, that's worth working hard for. This data set that he and I coded, and I, I, I've come to realize uh, until he reminded me that it has now become one of the biggest conflict data sets in the world, was done because of uh, mutual respect, which is important in every relationship. Uh, mutual respect about what the lim- your limitations are, what your partner's limitations are, and what you can do together. Because Kenneth kind of Felter cannot impose on me, nor I could impose on him. It just must have to be in the equilibrium that we must do this project together. And if we had been successful in coding this large data set, it was because of that mutual respect. And much of it was really uh, over beers too. So like, you know, the importance of relationship and closeness and stuff, then you, there you go. But it was possible because of the mutual respect between the parties involved. And it is mutual, Dennis. I hope you know that. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's a great place to stop. I'd like to thank both of you for coming on the Irregular Warfare podcast today and for sharing your insights. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Nick. Thanks again for listening to episode 11 of the Irregular Warfare podcast. We release a new episode every two weeks. In our next episode, Kyle and I will discuss unconventional warfare with Lieutenant General retired Ken Tovo and Dr. Melissa Lee. Following this, General David Petraeus will join us for a conversation about Islamic extremism and ungoverned spaces. Please be sure to subscribe to the Irregular Warfare podcast so you don't miss an episode. You can also follow and engage with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. One last note, what you hear in this episode are the views of the participants and do not represent those of West Point or any other agency of the U.S. or Philippine governments. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.